So Russ, uh, this week or Frederica this week, we're gonna be covering chapters two and three. Uh, chapters two were, uh, was planning ahead. So it's setting up our uh, particular uh, shiny app from an engineering standpoint or a, a, a development uh, standpoint. And then we're gonna move into chapter three, which is structuring your project. Now it only skirts the surface of Golem. It really just starts to talk about the folder structure, but it never really gets into the actual package itself. So I want both of you to realize or know that I hadn't actually worked with the package yet. I haven't started goal and I haven't actually went that uh, realm yet. Um, in fact, I was, I was kind of surprised uh, when I was reviewing both of these chapters. Uh, chapter two was pretty straightforward. It was simple. It was easy. Nothing really there going on. Chapter three seemed to extend for quite a while. Uh, I didn't know if I was going to get out of it before um, the, uh, last night uh, to go to bed. So um, we're going to go ahead and start with our uh, uh, chapter two, uh, preparing, for uh, preparing for success. Um, I did go ahead and write up some learning objectives, uh, Russ, just for your information and Frederica. Um, I did put a, a pull request into the uh, R4DS uh, EPGS repository. Okay, okay. Uh, so both of these, both of these uh, uh, sections or chapters that I wrote up uh, are committed. Um, whether they'll be accepted, that's a different story. So uh, the learning objectives for chapter two are learn the KISS method. And we're going to find that the KISS method is keep it simple, stupid. Um, it's not an implication that you're ignorant. It's not an implication that you're of any less intelligence. Keeping things simple means that it's going to be easier to orchestrate. And that's kind of a repeated uh, comment throughout this chapter two. The next learning objective I wrote is establishing good version control with uh, uh, constant innovation or CI process in addition to test sequences. So as we commit our changes, we have automation in the background that is testing or uh, validating our code to ensure that it's not breaking anything or that it's uh, uh, working within our um, particular paradigm or, or service that we're authoring. Uh, Russ, to your benefit, that linter, uh, lint R uh, package that you were referring to, that's actually where I was going with this whole test sequence concept. So when you commit your code, if the lint R is looking for any syntactical errors, that it would flag it and uh, 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 create some uh, issue tracking or, or uh, validation of the code uh, in commit. The third learning objective, we have comprehend development uh, comprehend and develop the team hierarchy. Uh, I need to change that wording. That doesn't make sense. Um, what I was trying to say is uh, set up your skill sets and set up your uh, position hierarchy, right? Um, have a shareholder or a stakeholder uh, that would re be responsible for the project. And then also your developers and any other support network uh, that will be required to uh, also instantiate this uh, service. Uh, there is a quote in this beginning. Uh, I don't speak French, but uh, I had to do a translation for it. Uh, Rome ne fut pas fiet tot en u jour. I don't think I pronounced that correctly, but the English translation states uh, Rome was not made in all in one day. Uh, and that's a Google translation. I think what it intended to say is Rome wasn't built in a day. Um, Frederick, I, I believe uh, being the uh, Italian that you are, uh, that right. may be a reference. So. Yeah, uh, uh, he says, um, Roma non è, non è stata fatta in un giorno. Ro Roma hasn't been made in one day, in just one there day. There we go. That's the... Awesome. That's a, that's a great translation. Thank you for adding that. Um, so the chapter is preparing for the project itself. Uh, projects that aren't planned will incur additional costs to unrankle bad code. Um, last week, uh, during our first introduction and chapter one session, we talked about complexity, how... Uh, how we manage complexity, what is complexity, how can complexity be uh, um, uh, wrangled into a good product or, or an enterprise or production grade shiny app. Uh, so if you start off on the wrong foot, if you start off in a very poor uh, proof of concept type method and never really uh, correct any of those errors, if this does go into a production setting or, or a maintenance type uh, environment, uh, it will be very difficult to maintain for a long period of time. Uh, I will be the first to admit that uh, during proof of concept or, or during development, uh, my code base is horrible. Uh, and so I had to take a lot from this particular chapter reading this section. Uh, it also talks about setting up version control. 
Now, there's multiple methods of version control. Uh, GitHub is the uh, current practice that the R4DS uh, service is using. Um, in my own personal, I use GitLab more often. Um, I've never used Bitbucket before, and I know there's a couple other version control uh, services out there, Subversion and, and uh, is it Mandria or, I always get that term mixed up, MariaDB and is it Mandrake? What's the other version Mercurial? control? Maybe is that's it? it, yeah. There's a couple of terms that really sound similar it's, to each other, so. I think it's Mercurial. Um, it's like HG on the command line or something like that. That they talk, is that it? Isn't it? Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, Mercurial, yeah. Researching a lot of different version control services, uh, I stumbled into some other areas that I wasn't aware of. And so I do want to pursue those, uh, gain some understanding of, of the differences, uh, benefits, and uh, uh, bad practices if you were to use that service. Um, and then finally, the organizing a hierarchy of personnel. So setting up that stakeholder, et cetera. Uh, the sooner you start with a robust framework, the better and the longer you, uh, you wait, the harder it gets to convert your application to a production ready one. So again, start off with the right foot. Uh, it may appear cumbersome. It may appear uh, complicated to uh, request all of these additional services when you're just developing a simple app. However, taking that practice in mind will prepare you for when it does become a production level or even a, a maintenance uh, type action, uh, long-term uh, support for this service. All right, next slide. Excuse me. There we go. Uh, so the KISS method, uh, we, I, I, I do have a, a very near and dear uh, story I'd like to share uh, using this uh, Lockheed Skunk Works uh, reference that the uh, author uh, added. Uh, Kelly Johnson was the lead engineer for the, uh, the uh, Lockheed Skunk Works. Uh, this was the uh, U-2 and the uh, uh, SR-71 development, say the 1960s, early 60s timeframe. Uh, what that engineer had stated or, or the comment in the book was that you give your uh, maintainers or your, your developers, we'll call them, uh, a common tool set. Don't get crazy. Don't get all weird with a bunch of odd tools. If you keep it simple and only use these common tools, you will be able to maintain it for a longer period of time with a lower aptitude of personnel. Okay, you don't need that specialty person uh, that uh, that only they can develop this particular service. Uh, I am a, a military vet, and so the Lockheed Skunk Works is near and dear to my heart. Uh, the military method is always uh, to take it down to the lowest common denominator. And so examples that I had within this developer environment uh, would be the Tinyverse uh, or dplyr or ggplot, um, maybe your uh, JSON, uh, uh, is it JSON light? Um, some of these packages that we will use uh, over and over again, build the common core set of every other developer within R. Uh, if you start to extend in some really crazy, uh, almost like dev tools type uh, applications, that's where you're going to really start pushing uh, away from the norm. Mm. Uh, Russ, do you have any thoughts there? I know you've developed some shiny content in the past. Yeah, I, um, I, uh, it's difficult because like the, there are there are different common sets of tools for different disciplines, and like I mean, I used to work in bioinformatics, and um, the uh, the the common kind of object types that they they use in the bioconductor packages were extremely difficult to use with tidyverse for, for oh really for quite a long time so they, they there was a bit of a kind of um compatibility problem there was it like so more like, base are then uh well yeah i mean you'd you'd you typically index using um the the base R syntax and, and things like that. But the, I mean, so if you're talking to people who work in uh, a, a more kind of biology focused world, the tidyverse is a lot newer of a um, uh, go-to package than it is in like more broader data science world but um okay. yeah I, I i do agree though that it, it's better to it's it's always good to 
try and um, experiment with what might be the 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 common set of tools in three, four, five years time. Okay. Um, so that when they're in, you know when they are common knowledge, you're not out of your depth. But yeah, uh, use the most boring tool that you can in your day to day <laughs> life, so that it makes go. everyone else's life a lot easier. Well, and, and it's not going to crash, or it's not going to have you know something of, of update is going to break your your code base, right? Mm -hmm. So this package that you're using gets an update, and all of a sudden now your your package doesn't run, and you have to to generate a whole bunch of other. You want to get to that more stable type yeah. baseline. But I also I, I don't think it's just from a developer perspective because uh, okay. you know the better the better established the better tested and and things tools are uh, typically have less security issues and 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 things like that as well. So it, yeah, I mean it's um, you win on a few fronts if you use um, good point standard and uh, you know. Uh, uh, powerful tools. Yeah. First thing that comes to mind with this, not related to R, but just the Arch Linux uh, environment. Um, anytime that you go into that Arch, you automatically have this awesome, you know, crazy Linuxy awesome sauce. But then on the same token, uh, you do a package update, and all of a sudden your system crashes, and and the computer is rendered almost useless. It's mm -hmm. it's kind of that same concept, right? If you go to bleeding edge, you might kind of start running a risk. Um, uh, keep closer to the to the tools that that are more common, and then um, various levels of workforce aptitude leads towards varying degrees of success. So again, if you bring that barrier of access down, right, these common tools that people are familiar with, if you use those applications, you will access a wider audience of potential workforce, potential developers, people that are familiar with with your code. Um, if you extend into some really oddball uh, type details, it just reduces that uh, quantity of people that may be able to assist. If your team chooses to use abstract packages, this is a, a paragraph out of the text. Uh, if they choose to use abstract packages, make sure that it's for a particular service, something very extremely unique, and that there's a good reason for you to go uh, into that extension. The more complex you build uh, your orchestration, the harder it will be for talent to maintain that service. And the, the first things that come to mind when I read that sentence was the Microsoft code base and the Oracle code base. Um, I don't know if any, uh, Russ or Frederica, if you've had any experience with either of those uh, applications from a, a sysadmin standpoint, but I just shake my head sometimes. I, I really have no idea why something acts the way it does. Um, it's nearly impossible to find a, a, a problem but at any rate. Okay. So working as a team. So this is talking about the tools and the structure. Um, the choice of tools and how, to, uh, how the team is structured is crucial for success, not entirely like the KISS method. So don't confuse uh, the two uh, objectives here. KISS is keeping it simple. Uh, where we're selecting our tools and our structure, this is going to be more uh, towards that uh, common ground that, that everyone's familiar with, okay? So uh, examples that I had was, um, uh, Get, uh, GitHub versus GitLab, right? What are the cost benefits of one versus the other? Uh, bare bones hardware or containerization. Would it be easier to deploy our application on a bare, bone, bare bones server uh, and build it up from there? Or would this containerized uh, serverless environment be more optimal, right? There's definitely benefits and complexity to, to both directions. Mm -hmm. Okay, the choice of the, the team would be uh, what would be uh, best suited for this environment. Uh, from a tool's point of view, version control and test all things. Do not, do not, do not release anything that hasn't been tested. Okay, do not push to production anything that hasn't been tested and validated. Uh, the comment about version control is that it allows for that diff doc or comparison. So as you're writing your code base and you commit that change or you, you branch, um, uh, modify, and then commit, I had a, uh, a workflow down here uh, that I just pulled off the top of my head. But um, if you're using a version control like GitHub or GitLab, right, you're going to be able to branch that repository, make a change to a file, uh, test, validate, uh, commit. Uh, if you're using GitLab, they have CI CD process. Uh, commit that change and then put a pull request to the owner of that repository. And then that owner will merge it in if they choose to. 
Okay, so that's a good example of a, a workflow uh, from, a, from a version control type service. The next comment says, small is beautiful. And by the way, uh, Russ and Frederica, if you are following uh, the textbook uh, with these uh, particular uh, outlines that I created, um, I didn't use the markdown ABCD. Obviously that uh, syntax isn't re uh, related. So when it started to talk about ABCD and each of those heading levels, um, I've prefaced that with one, two, three, four instead, so not to be confusing. Okay. Right. But, all right. Uh, smaller, more manageable pieces make it easier to develop. So if you start to break down your structure of uh, compiling this larger application, if you break it down into these small and co smaller common denominators, it does make it easier to make minor changes to those uh, smaller packages or smaller services, and then as it compiles uh, into a larger application. Teams maybe even work in parallel, but be cautious with this statement. Um, that wasn't a direct statement out of the text. I added that in there. Uh, I ran into this in the past. So if you do break up into multiple teams, there's a statement in the text where it talks about tier three, tier four uh, are the, uh, the, the authors of the document. They were saying that their workforce is often broken into three and four team groups to develop a particular app. Okay, we'll say that you split that in half. Let's just say it's a four person team and you split that in half. Now you've got two members on one side, two members on the other. And there's an image uh, that I didn't incorporate but it talks about uh, uh, sub uh, processes. If those two teams were working in parallel with each other, you want to be careful because sometimes they may access the same file. You may have some conflicts uh, with your commits, et cetera. Uh, so please be cautious if you're working in teams, okay? Uh, large code bases implies that it uh, that the safe work uh, safe way to work is to split the app into pieces, extract your core non-reactive functions, which will uh, also be called the business logic, and include them in external files. Most there's going to be a reference in chapter three, but it talks about these business logic uh, components within a shiny application. These business logics are really just our code, right? These are these are standalone R scripts. They are part of your R environment on the server side. The user uh, or the app uh, UI uh, service, they don't get to see what processing is happening in the background. And so from a development standpoint, please be cautious of what code is uh, available uh, to your user. Uh, you may inadvertently uh, supply some possibly intellectual property uh, or, or some code that may not uh, want uh, users to see. That's a security mechanism too. Okay. All right. Uh, my examples here that I was talking about were with non-reactive functions include like your uh, non-vital linkages, maybe data ingestion pipelines, databasing, JSON files, CSV reading, et cetera. Uh, page layouts, uh, theming. Uh, so maybe you have your own CSS that you want to deploy uh, within your Shiny app. And then also um, all of the expansions, they won't break the core of the, the service. So any expansion that you have uh, or create. Frederica, Russ, do you have any questions thus far? Am I covering the topic to no, the degree this needed? This is or? A, a topic that's very close to my heart. I do, is the, it? Okay. The, 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 you know, it's in before this. We <laughs> took a, a 4,000 line user interface file and split it into like 10 oh my goodness. files because it was just like, it, it was way bigger than it needed to be and was impossible right. to navigate and things like that. I mean, I know it's not exactly, you know, it's not the, the same as, you know, the, it, 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 there's no parallel to teamwork and things like that, but making right. things, making things um, self-contained and, um, you know, enough for you to hold in your brain is so important like yes uh, yes uh, anyway yeah uh, no I, I, uh, no it's really good uh, yeah thanks yeah keep okay going. so uh, now we're switching from uh, the tools point of view uh, now we're switching over to the team's point of view and here's where i was uh, expressing some of the details about selecting a manager so you want this individual to be a stakeholder um, he or she may be uh, the core developer. They may be the first person to come up with this particular idea. And then as the idea grows, uh, you add additional uh, workforce, labor force uh, to start um, uh, building that app. 
And so that manager or stakeholder project manager, you want them to really be the, the chairholder or the guide for this project, keeping everyone else uh, in check. Okay, uh, possibly the owner of the repository, maybe the, the individual that's signing off on the merge requests, et cetera, pull requests. Uh, select one or more core developers that are skilled but specific in their field of study. So here, as you break down your team, you're selecting these individuals that may have complement in one service, but maybe not in another. And so you want to uh, assign those users something that they're very, very comfortable with and confident with because you're going to get a good product out of that team. If you give them something they're unfamiliar with, now you're kind of uh, uh, trying to climb the mountain at the same time of, of writing or developing your app. So again, that selection of hierarchy is key. Select one or more core developers. I already said that. Uh, follow the Git workflow. Uh, this was a comment out of the book, and that's why I added that uh, up statement up above with the, uh, the Git workflow. This is with issue tracking and managing pull requests. So as the app is living, right, as it is a production level and somebody finds an error in the code, maybe a, a characteristic isn't working the right way, or I, I, I add some data and then it, it you know, bugs out the code, whatever the case is, don't try to prevent yourself from going in and just making the modification right there. Uh, instead, issue a, a uh, tracker, uh, is, uh, submit an issue report, uh, because that will kind of give you a breadcrumb to the changes made. Uh, we talk about version control quite often. Uh, there's a section about metadata. And so make sure that your version control is uh, well structured. So you know what uh, particular re uh, revision the, uh, the uh, application is at at the moment. Okay. Uh, there is a link that I added in here and it doesn't look like the markdown worked properly, uh, but uh, it's to uh, refactoring at scale. Uh, I did want to make a note if anybody uh, in the future chooses to go this route. Uh, this is a paid book from O'Reilly, uh, so it's not like our, our open source side where we can just access it. Um, I may look into that at a future point of uh, purchase, but I'm not going to willingly jump forward to it. I may go to the library and check it out instead. Okay. So, all right. It's mentioned throughout the... Uh... The, the engineering shiny book, isn't it? I, I, I've read a couple of it chapters is. Of, of refactoring at scale, but uh, okay. I think it's well, I think we can get a scale beyond mine. Um, but, yeah. Well, here in a moment, uh, section three, uh, if you don't mind me expanding, but section three talks a lot about code comparison. And mm -hmm. so it, it, it shows you uh, three different ways of the same function in operation, and then showing you how to refactor it and, and make it into a short, sweet, concise, and, and, and actually uh, more efficient code base. Uh, that refactoring book probably leads towards a lot of the steps required to think in that mindset. Um, not everybody uh, is, is familiar with that or, or conf yeah. confident in that. The first thing that comes to mind when I'm thinking in this subject would be, um, you know, like a, a break command uh, within a, a service versus a uh, if else statement versus a for loop that has a break point, right? Each, each method of ingestion or, or processing is going to be the same, but some may be more eloquent or optimized. So, yeah. Okay. But, but refactoring though can cause problems across, across a team because okay. um, if, if I'm working on a, a specific issue and being professional, I do the refactorings required to make fixing that bug easy before okay. I actually fix that bug. Um, I can touch quite a lot of code and that can, you know, even if it's just code that I think would be useful to clean up before I fix that bug. It, um, if a colleague is working in the same files or whatever, refactoring a lot of code can lead to you hindering everyone else's progress so you have to you have to be pretty narrow-minded about what you refactor at any point particularly if it's like a kind of preemptive thing before introducing a feature or a fixing a bug or something like that okay. um, certainly like um, I, I like the idea of this refactoring at scale like the 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 la large scale refactorings that you can do but it's quite easy when you're working at a small scale to think, 
oh, I've changed that line here. And there's similar lines in eight, nine, 10 different places across this project. Yes. Why don't I just go and modify those at the same time so that they, uh, the same, you know, so that, you know, say I introduce a more general function to do that. Why don't I then call that from all the other places? But, you know, mm -hmm. your colleague could be working on other, other files that, that you've just touched and it may cause them. Break what he, yeah, break what they're trying to do. Yeah. Uh, Good point. I think it's quite rare. It's certainly rare in my experience that, that you'd, you'd, you'd end up doing like, you know, if, if the feedback loops are slow or, you know, people are working in long branches and stuff, it's quite easy to cause problems doing that kind of thing. Actually, I, I do have a question about branching, if you don't mind. Uh, Frederica, feel welcome to jump in too. So there was a, I think it was a Twitter post or it was some kind of developer thread that I was reading. Anyway, it, it, it posed a question about whether or not to delete branches. Like after the merge is finished, do you delete the branch? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, because supposedly, and I'm not familiar with this or I don't use it often enough to, to create such a, uh, uh, a large scale of disarray, but um, there's a thought process to whether or not you are uh, kind of a hoarder and you keep all your branches. So like your computer is just filled with all of this extra code base that you'll never actually go back and use uh, different versions of, of whatever you did to branch and, and modify. Um, where others, as soon as the uh, the uh, issue is closed or the or the pull request is accepted, they automatically delete that branch. And so there's a there's a school of thought to version control whether or not to uh, 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 keep clean and tidy uh, within your version control service. So it's uh, efficient to find out the status of things. Or others may feel, well, I want this you know uh, uh, particular um, tracking all the way to the very dawn of time when that file was created kind of concept. I don't know if you both have any thoughts on that regard. Uh, I may uh, just I, open some of them. <laughs> Go ahead. Federica? Um, I was saying, I have quite a certain number of questions about these things. <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, I found the same um, the, so issue. Uh, I issued myself about the, the branches. Okay. If to delete them or not, uh, uh, when and in what conditions. Because, for example, you may, what, what happens if you cancel the, the, the branch? Nothing, nothing happened. You, you just cannot push your, uh, where, um, your changes through that that branch and, uh, anymore, but otherwise nothing, uh, nothing changed basically. But uh, what um, my, personally what's happened to me is uh, um, that I've made some changes through a branch and then these changes uh, basically have not rightly immediately been accepted. Uh, so um, then, um, I don't know, it's just like that I kept going within my GitHub, adding things, uh, and, and just didn't up, not updating um, no. The, the 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 other things that I've already pushed and not be uh, been accepted, mm -hmm. so uh, it's it just like created a sort of uh, um, how is how is that called uh, when uh, like a block, you know? A you know, you, a conflict, yeah. right? Yeah. So at that point, you don't mind because uh, your your things inside the, the project are are okay. You don't mind the things change it there, uh, but you cannot use it that branch anymore, basically. Right. Yes. Because I can see where that. Maybe I, I didn't say say clearly, but you know you have a conflict. You cannot. Uh, there might be two options. So you, it takes a long time for you to get back and change all the all the little things that. Um, uh, are not being accepted or maybe pass it through somewhere, uh, some other ways. 
uh, or uh, basically you don't care about that. So you have finished with that bit of the project, you don't touch it anymore, but maybe you want to use that branch again mm -hmm. for, for pushing things, but you cannot use it anymore because uh, the, the, there is a conflict. At that point, you, if you want, you can delete it. I think, I believe, uh, I think it's, that can be done easily, but uh, I didn't do it. So I have the same doubt about these things. Good point. No, I, I, uh, there's so many things that come to mind when you're when you're talking about this particular situation, and it, it, it's it's all related to uh, almost like going rogue with the code. And I know that's probably the wrong implication that I'm I'm saying. Uh, anytime you hear the word rogue, you think it's somebody that's not following the rules. It's not that you have modified the code base to a degree that it's no longer even the right code base anymore. So it's almost like forking, but like you didn't actually fork the project, you branched it with never committing it back into the source. Um, there's a lot to do with that. And I, I the, the first thought that comes to mind is organic growth. Um, so your your team guidance, and, and I, I'm not, Frederica, please do not believe that I'm uh, implying that that uh, um, your actions are, are uh, not warranted. I'm <laughs> trying to to say that that working as a collaborative team and then following this Git workflow, that scenario is kind of almost taboo within this workflow. Did that make sense? Because you're 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 really not working collaboratively anymore. Now it's kind of like a solo operation, right? You've 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 kind of taken the the path a different direction, which is good in open source. I that's that's a very common practice in open source. The Merging it back together, though, can be extremely conflicting. And I, I, I can sense from your experience that that is currently the status that you're at at the moment. OK, so, yeah, I think it's uh, quite different working in team mm -hmm. than working alone. So you need to be careful about many things. Yes, uh, yes. But uh, um, I found that GitHub, uh, as a version control um, portal, it's very good for these things because you cannot actually delete or make any modifications that are not right. allowed uh, if you're not allowed to make these <laughs> changes, yes. obviously, uh, because they need to pass through the, 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 the others in the team. So that's mm -hmm. good. Just yes. if you are alone, so then you can do whatever you want. If you change your mind, you delete it, then you uh, like, you didn't want to delete it and then you now you have deleted so you cannot do right. anything and you cannot blame anyone else than no. you than yourself but um, you know i think it's better working in team personally i always uh, thought about because if mm, you you have someone else to to ask about things you there, there is at uh, some point uh, uh, you, you know a doubt and, and uh, it's a good like support to have someone else in the team that just say, uh, that's good, that, that, that's correct, just go forward and, you know, or maybe giving to you the right, the right direction um, if, it, if I like it's not the case. I like to think of those as anchoring points. I, I, I really, really, really appreciate working in a collaborative team where it fosters a good growth pattern uh, not conflicting, but but actually like anchoring, right? So like, hey, that's a great idea. Let's go see what you can do with it. You know, more supportive than it is uh, restrictive. And and that gets, we're kind of almost. I'm I'm taking the thought process into more of a, a, a kind of a team orchestration type level. But um, your your code base is no different uh, when you have many members that are are all actively working on the the same point we're humans, we're going to get into an argument. It's just inevitable. Uh, nobody's going to be uh, rose colored glasses 100% of the time. Um, that comment of anchoring to me is is a person that has confidence and, and familiar with the direction that you're going, supportive of what you're doing uh, so that we can work towards merging all of that together. Uh, Frederica, have you ever messed with the, the branch tree at all within GitHub? So your your branch tree is is just that it's it's the commits of where things have been uh, uh, 
branched, merged together. Um, it's a great tool to follow a timeline of, of how a development practice works. Um, it's not just ownership or, or being able to track with, with another user, uh, but it may give you an idea of possibly how different your code base may be from the, from the source repository. Right. Uh, um, actually, what, what's happened to me um, is that um, I was making changes uh, in my main branch. I did fork this repository, but okay. then if, if you want to push things, you need to jump, uh, use another, uh, another branch, a different branch, not, not right. the main branch. Okay, the main branch is, is yours, you know? But what I did it is uh, using the main branch for making my things then have, have uh, the project uh, settled as I like it. So I made all the changes, every, everything. And then um, what, when I, I de decided which part I wanted to effectively push uh, through, through the, um, the, the main one, the, the, mm -hmm. the repository, I, uh, I used another branch, a different branch. So I did push the thing, that was fine. But then um, I also made further changes in the branch that I, I supposed to use to push the thing. So the second branch, I don't know if I, it does make change. No, I do, so 100%, yeah. Okay, okay, so at that point, the, those things didn't need to be uh, issued because I've used the, the, the second branch for making my personal changes. And that, so uh, basically uh, that, that, that's because of practice. No, you know, you, you do practicing things and everything, uh, but it, it doesn't matter actually, because you can just open up a, a different branch and push your, your new things uh, right. with a different branch. You don't use the, the the other one anymore. Nothing happened basically. Just if you have some rules to to follow, and you have that branch, the, at that point you need a bit of work. But you can go out of this. <laughs> you right. know, you can work it out. You just fix it, everything. But you don't need it. Basically. I I didn't need it. Mm, I just opened up a, a, a different branch branch and use a new one. I'll uh, if if it's okay with you, I will definitely sidebar with you because I'm really I'm really interested to to uh, assist and or comprehend exactly the uh, the error or not error uh, the situation that you find yourself in. Uh, this is really interesting to um, okay. work within an environment like that uh, that that has such fracturing or such uh, splitting branching going on. Um, how to uh, how to get back into the center again. Um, the next chapter that we have is chapter three, and that's talking about structuring your project. Within this particular chapter, this is actually the longer of the material. And Russ, looking at the time, we've got about 18 minutes left uh, before the uh, the call's over. I don't know if I'll be able to get through all that's of this. Cool. We, but We can roll things over to next week, okay. and, and if you like. Um, this is a really big chapter, but uh, the notes that I took are... It, it, the length of the chapter is really based on the code that was included in it. So you had yeah, yeah. multiple, multiple pages, but actually the material is probably about the same. Um, in my examples, I don't have any of that code base. I'll actually, uh, you'll see, I'll make a reference to going and checking it out. And I, I do have the tab open. Um, the learning objectives for this particular section uh, I wrote down is learn the Golem file structure for building Shiny apps. So again, I stated that in chapter three, we don't, actively pursue the use of Golem yet, we are establishing a foundation of how Golem works, right? Or how the file structure within Golem works. Uh, the second is managing dependencies and namespace files. Uh, those are two key terms. I should probably highlight those uh, or, or even codify them uh, so they stand out more. Uh, there's actually two files called the dependency and a namespace file. Uh, these are going to be related to your environment, our environment, uh, versus those uh, business, uh, uh, excuse me. I'm gonna have to repeat myself uh, or, or <laughs> pause for a second because it does clarify what these two terms mean. Uh, apply proper documentation or principles for app maintenance, use and future development. 
And then finally, comprehend the future use of Golem. So earlier, uh, I had stated that it may become, or it may appear that just having a off the cuff, uh, quick, you know, proof of concept, shiny app, you know, you spend a half an hour, an hour, two hours, kind of the tidy Tuesday uh, type exercises. So you build this one-off application. Uh, if you really structure it in a formal manner using a version control system, Golem and all the uh, features that come along with, it will be easily reproduced by another user. And again, that leads towards that, uh, uh, what's the word I was looking for? It starts with a C. Uh, cohesion, uh, collaboration, that was the word. Yeah. Uh, team collaboration, being able to pass the package from one user to the next. If you have all of this version control and, and, and dependency uh, criteria taken care of, uh, uh, somebody else would be able to just open it and run with it instead of uh, worrying about the uh, uh, dependency points. Okay. So Shiny uh, app as a package. Russ, did you want to say anything? Uh, yeah, I'm still to be convinced that it's a good thing that uh, okay. an app should be uh, constructed as a package but because the, um, the Shiny app structure itself is... Uh, Oh, my dog's barking. Sorry. Um, no worries. If you've got all your, <laughs> sorry, I'll have to let him out. He's that's okay. Um, no worries. Go on, go on. Out you go. Out you go. Um, if you've got all your what was called business logic, and you've got your modules and things like that defined in the R subdirectory, mm -hmm. then your app is already halfway to be instructed. Uh, it as an R package, even if you've got an app.r or a UI and server in the top level. Um, the, the benefits in going from having the app.r at the top level to having to ha having it in a package structure that can be installed and then um, uh, around, I, I, I've yet to see the value. The, the only time when it's caused me an issue if uh, an app isn't in a formal package structure is when running test coverage. I see. Um, so test that was fine, but when using, is it uh, COVR, COVR, um, if, if an app wasn't in um, if it didn't have a namespace and it didn't have the various other trappings of an R package, um, it just failed for me. But yeah, uh, I mean, if, f from the point of like a, a sensible organizational structure, um, r a, a, a kind of defined deployment um, uh, p p pipeline and, and things like that, you can do that stuff quite readily without having to organize your code exactly as an R package. And Do you find to be honest, to be honest, things that go along with R packaging, things like, you know, the, the R command check and, and, and things like that, they're, if anything, they're probably a bit overly restrictive on how your uh, well, code should be structured to me. but. I was thinking about your your lint r package that you had yeah, mentioned yeah. so uh during the validation test lint r was not able to pass its own code base <laughs> right so like it's it's checking itself but then it's airing out um that's a that's a really good example of, of possibly where this is i was going to extend this thought into um this is often kind of extremely formal, right? It's it, So I'm gonna use a school of thought, but please, uh, if anybody's listening or wants to comment on this in the future, um, you have this mindset of engineering being working in a crystal tower, right? Like everything's perfect. Uh, uh, you know, uh, fluid dynamics, aerodynamics, uh, uh, mechanics, uh, uh, precision, et cetera. Like everything's perfect. And then you get out in the field and you realize none of that really is mattering uh, because that's not really how the world works. Right, we work in a more dynamic environment. So engineering, faking in a uh, in a crystal tower, 
may not take into account the environmental variables that their service is being used in. And I, I know my comfort zone is, is in more uh, material uh, possession, but when we look at the deployment or the use of a packaging service, Shiny as a package, uh, it comes along with a hefty amount of additional to-dos that you really weren't taking into account. Uh, or, or, or that may not be needed if it's just that proof of concept mindset. Does that make sense, Russ? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, um, yeah, yeah. I, I had to. No, I, had I, I can see that there are benefits to 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 kind of formalizing the structure of your apps and things. But uh, I've yeah, never, it's... I've never used some of these tools, so uh, I yeah. just oh, want yeah, yeah. to let everyone know that this whole book or this this process, this uh, uh, direction we're going with with engineering. I want to test it out and I want to form my opinion on whether or not it's good or bad, but I'm also very respectful to those that have been using it and their opinions as well. Um, it, it's the word bias, right? You don't want to be biased uh, uh, when you're first starting out. Um, you may form a mindset that, that uh, could be in conflict, but um, so the, the two things that came out of, of section one, uh, paragraph 3.1, uh, goal is an is an opinionated framework for building production ready shiny apps. Uh, Russ, I think the highlighting the word opinionated is probably the best term I don't, in that I, sense, I, right? I, I'm glad that yeah. there are frameworks because, uh, you know, it, the, um, the, uh, the, yeah, the, sh shiny apps can be in a variety of structures and like um, the, an opinionated framework does help people out in that you know it, if someone presents you some code to work on and it is in a, a kind of a structure typical of a golem app or if you're handed a, a you know a django app in 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 python or something like that yeah. there's uh, the the structuring and your your obligation to work within the structure that the framework forces upon you helps out um, any collaborators who might come into it. So I, I I do see it as a really good thing that that Gollum exists. It's just that it's not really um, it some some of its opinions might not strike me as being particularly valid but um, anyway do you find do you find any of these services being restrictive right this this structure this this workflow this actually uh, no i probably no, no i i don't i don't think so no it just okay. uh it's just an extra hurdle to push code over that that sometimes doesn't really bring a great deal of benefit but yeah i it, it's not like getting over that hurdle would be a restriction okay. on what I could do with it. But yeah, sorry, I, I take your point. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, so the next section is what is in production grade Shiny app? Like what is it? What is contained? Why, why, why are we going this route? Um, using one file or splitting into two files, we want to make sure that uh, uh, you start off on the right foot. Uh, if you build a simple app, uh, and it's, it's contained in a, in a single file structure with your uh, UI and, and, and server code uh, within one file, okay, it's only 10 lines, 20 lines, 30 lines, okay, it's simple. As that particular app begins to grow though, if you have it in that single container, it makes the code base very difficult because you're constantly scrolling up and down and trying to match your uh, UI versus server calls. We will discover that this is an arbitrary question when managing large production uh, level shiny apps. The word I used uh, arbitrary or the reason I used arbitrary was it's kind of up for debate. Um, it, it, it's implied that uh, if we follow chapter two and we're talking about these different folder structures and, and using uh, uh, packaging services, uh, it's already implied that it's going to be in multiple files, right? So it's never going to be in a single file, uh, maybe initially, but it's going to start to branch out from there. Uh, modular, modularizing. Uh, I copied and pasted this sentence multiple times throughout the text. I don't think it's a good vocabulary term. I probably made it up uh, as I went, but modularizing code will be your success factor. Trying to uh, take that 
small element of function that may you know use multiple times over again let's put that in a different uh, 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 modular service so that i can just call on it within my text and know with certainty that it's going to do the process i've guided it uh, or created to, it to do um metadata I, I think it's i think it's important there to distinguish between the um the shiny module um entity from okay. the concept of modularizing code because you know um modularizing is more about splitting up code into logically connected structures okay. of which the shiny module provides one particular aspect of but but your the 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 sim you, the more typical way that you will split up code in in shiny is to most of your code should be just functions it should should be the non-reactive stuff I, I, see. I, I would have thought whereas like the the module uh the the entities that shiny calls modules are a form of modularization that is kind of wrapped around the reactivity layers and and, and how the ui and the server um talk to each other but really okay. the you know you can have ui functions that you pull in you can have functions that act on data that your server calls to um and the act of constructing those functions is just as important as is um splitting up the reactive components into you know the the front to back end communication into the the shiny modules really like i mean you can have you can have you can split an app into shiny modules and it will still be complicated to follow unless you you know named your functions well and things like that and that's actually part of a section at the bottom here talking about naming convention or or, or the naming of of not only functions but also uh what's the term that they were using uh, it's not variables uh there's a there's a comment in here where they say if you uh it's it's uh they were using an example of a button an actual radio button and that yeah. if you call it so that when you evoke that particular uh, uh, object, uh, this this radio button, that the naming convention that goes along with it would be this term and then preface with another attribute, right? Uh, concatenate uh, between a variable and, and some static value so that it creates a unique identifier. And I, I, I found that very well uh, uh, thought process uh, that the, the, we haven't actually got to the comparison of the code bases yet, but um, I found reading those two sections or comparing those two codes together uh, started to make sense what we were doing. Okay. Um, I, we've got three minutes left. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I, do you want, I mean, you've, you've obviously got a, a meeting after this. Do you, do you want I do. to, re, we can, we can regroup next week, next week and talk about chapter three, if okay. you like. Sure. If that's okay um, with you. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool by me. Um, so um i can probably throw together some notes on the the chapter four as well that we can um discuss after you've done chapter three if okay if do next week and i'll kind of configure the uh timeline a little bit differently um, okay yeah okay no, you're not in, you're not in control of the repository are you russ it's, no no it's no, going no. Through not, the not entirely yesterday. not on okay. my own no um, all right um i i do have commit well i don't have i don't have the rights to commit without being reviewed uh I see. That's right. good. <laughs> but um yeah uh i i can i can merge your pull requests okay uh, I, if you want to take a look at it um if you find anything in error please don't hesitate to uh comment or, or uh, put it on there i'll uh, i'll track with it as well so okay okay great well, brilliant. Um, well, thanks for taking us through that. Uh, and uh, I mean, uh, we'll we'll look forward to, to talking about chapter three next week then. Uh, awesome. Cool. Brilliant. Right. Cool. Right. <laughs> I'll see you on next week. All right. <laughs> thanks, everyone. I appreciate it. Have a good day. Yeah.
Bye. Bye. <laughs>